always desires a relationship with you, and he will go to extremes to prove it. And there's one story in particular that Jesus tells that shows exactly how serious he is about that. And Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. Good crowd. Good to see you guys here. And a lot of you guys watching, watching out there, welcome as well. Um, so last week, um, I told you a whole bunch of scenarios from the life of Jesus where he showed grace and truth um, in, in his dynamic as he, as he met with people. And we said that as a church, we, we need to make sure that we take full hold of grace and we take full hold of truth and we never let go uh, of either one. And there's always going to be a tension w- when we do that. Um, and so last week we, we looked, we showed how Jesus modeled it in specific situations. Today we're going to talk about a situation where Jesus actually teaches this. A uh, very familiar story. It's one once I start, most of you could probably, uh, you know, get the basic story part of it and not have any problem. I think the thing that made this teaching that we're going to go to today uh, with Jesus so significant is as he begins to teach, he finds himself surrounded by two groups of people. Now, what I mean, it's a little bit different here. I mean, you guys made the choice to come here, so uh, there was something about this place or the people or the music or the teaching that you, you have positive feelings towards this. So I know that as I prepare my, my teaching and all of this kind of thing, so it kind of helps. Well, Jesus didn't have that when he do that. When, when, when he typically taught, especially in this circumstance, He's going to have two completely different groups of people that that are going to be in the crowd listening. Uh, One group of people are going to be a group of people who felt that they were so alienated from God that they had absolutely no chance ever for God to approve of them. On the other side, there was another group of people who thought that they were so good that God was really kind of blessed to have them around. And and so, you you know, he he kind kind of had these two. So Jesus, as a teacher, has to tackle this very difficult issue of teaching both of them. You know, it'd be very easy to lean one way or the other, but of teaching both of them and and teaching this idea of grace and truth. But, uh, and so, and so he kind of does this thing. And I want to remind you of how it started, just so you'll know. There was a time when Jesus was teaching and it said, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. We talked about Matthew last week and how he was a tax collector and that was like a whole another level of sin. So you see it worded here, the tax collectors and the sinners uh, were there to hear him. Um, Everybody else was there. This was the group that were just so sure because of the religious system of the day that there was nothing they could do and God could never be pleased with them. But they came to hear Jesus, all right? So, so basically what was happening was the people who were considered the worst people in society in the first century would come to hear Jesus. Now, now if that were to happen today, that means that if, that if Jesus was, was a pastor today and you were like a good person, it would mean that by the time you got to church, that like the whole half, front half of the church would already be filled up by the worst people in town. I mean, they're the ones that are here. And they're here before you get here. And, and so there's this dynamic going on. And that's so interesting to me uh, when, when we think of that because that's different from our church experience today, isn't it? I mean, it's different from, from, from our perception of the local church uh, and, and what it should be. Uh, but we need to get this right, okay? So this is what we're going to talk about. And he goes on. So the tax collector is sinners. And who is the other group? Well, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, okay? They weren't happy that these other people were there, muttered, and look what they said, this man welcomes and eats with sinners, okay, welcome, come on in, he eats with them, no restaurants back then, if you ate with somebody, you either invited them into your home, or you were invited into theirs, so it was a little more intimate than even, well, let's just meet, you know, at the restaurant, or something like this, and, and, and it was funny, because these, the the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they couldn't figure out why Jesus wanted these people around. They they, they couldn't figure out why these people who were nothing like Jesus, the the sinners, why these people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And and why Jesus seemed to like them, because they certainly didn't like him. And and what was just as confusing was, was Jesus actually had a whole lot more in common with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In fact, 
he was just about in 100% agreement with them what they taught the scripture said and, and, and all of that kind of system. And yet he attracted a group of people that were nothing like the Pharisees, nothing like the teachers of the law. So there's this tension. And it's almost like, you know, if we'd had an auditorium with instead of three sections, we had two and one group is over here, one group is over here, and they're just kind of glaring at each other. You know, as Jesus gets up and begins to teach. And you remember when this happened, he told them three stories, you remember? He told them a story about a guy that had a hundred sheep and lost one. And then he told them a story about a woman who had ten coins and lost one and how that person went to all kinds of extremes to, to, to make sure that they had one even though they, uh, they had the 99 sheep or, or in her case the, the nine coins. And then he's going to talk about, so he's going to talk about a lost coin, a lost sheep, but then he's going to talk about something much more valuable. And that's a lost person. A lost person. What is a lost person worth to God? And this is what both sides needed to hear. And to use this, instead of, you know, pulling a person up there and telling this guy's life story, he uses a teaching device that you're familiar with if you've been in church for a while. At least you've heard the word. It's called a parable, okay? If you're new to this, this is what you need to know. That a parable is a story that's not true, that's used to illustrate something that is true. In other words, it's a made-up story, okay? It's a once-upon-a-time kind of thing. But the, there was always a point to it, not just to tell a neat story so people would walk away and go, that was nice or entertaining, but so they go, wow, I get it. And so that's what a parable was for. And, and so he's going to do this, and before they could you know, even process the story about the 99 sheep and the nine coins, Jesus says, let me tell you one more story. And here's where, like I said, you could all just about hop in, so I'm going to kind of race through it and then get to our application today. So he said that there was a man who had two sons. There was a man who had two sons, and he had an older son and he had a younger son. The, the older son was the behavior in the family. The younger son was the misbehavior. Now, now I, have a, I have a sister. I have two sisters, in fact. Uh, you can guess which one of those two I am. I'm the misbehavior in my family. And the way you guys are smiling, you're probably the misbehavior in your family, right? So, so, so you get it. You understand. Now, remember, this is a made-up story. So Jesus is really going to go to some extremes here uh, to, to make a point. He says that the younger boy goes up to his father one day, and, and, and he essentially said, Dad, I wish that you would go ahead and die because I want my inheritance. So, so, so by law, he had, by tradition, he had an inheritance coming to him, but you had to wait until the father died. And so the kid basically just walks up to his dad and says, I want my inheritance now. You know, it's as if you're dead to me. And so, and, and this is the amazing thing about the teaching of Jesus. So here you got the sinners and the, the, the uh, tax collectors on one side. They're saying, that kid's awful. And you got the Pharisees and the teachers of law on this side. You know what they're saying? That kid's awful. <laughs> he got this whole crowd who doesn't even like each other all nodding their head at the same time. I mean, this is the amazing uh, teacher that Jesus was. I mean, everybody in the audience was equally angry at this kid. And, and be, why? Because Pharisees and keepers of the law had sons. And tax collectors and sinners had sons. And so they got it, okay? that They understood. But because Jesus is making up this story, like I said, he can really go to an extreme here. So here's what he's going to do. The father in the story actually says, okay, I'll give you your money. Now, understand, that would have never happened. That would have never happened. In fact, if they had followed the old Jewish law, they would have taken the kid out and stoned him. Remember the stone from last week? They had taken the, kid, the rebellious kid out and stoned him, but they didn't do that. So he gives the younger son what he would have received had the father died. He go ahead and gives it to him. And you could have heard a pin drop in the I mean, they're probably thinking, who would have done such a thing? I mean, this, this is just so crazy. And, and, and Jesus says that this kid then decides, well, I got all this money. This town's too small for me. Okay, so, so he's going to get out. And, and in Scripture, if you read the way Luke recorded it, he says that he went off to a far country. Okay, got as far away from home as he could. He has no dad. He has no rules. He has no boundaries. And he's got all the money in the world to him. Okay, he's got all that going on. He buys into a lifestyle that's great while it lasts but you can't afford it very long, all right? So before long, a much shorter time span probably than he would have thought, he used up everything that his father had given him. Scripture uses the word he squandered it. It's a great word, okay? I mean, we know exactly what happened. And again, th this audience is in agreement. They're angry at this make-believe son. They couldn't believe how bad, but they, but they were kind of glad. Good. He ran out of money. He's stuck. 
And Jesus says the story gets even worse than that. And both sides are going, yeah, you know, this is great. A famine comes to the country. And this young man who had run out of money and his friends had left when the money ran out and all of this, he couldn't find a job until one day. And he got the, the only job that this young Jewish boy could find. That was actually feeding pigs. You know that Jews don't want to have anything to do with, with anything. And, and it says, you know, again, the Pharisees are saying, yeah, he's finally get what he deserves. And Jesus goes on to this extreme. And he says, the kid got so hungry that this food, which is all, all the food you feed the pigs is what everybody didn't eat on their plate. You know, you just scrape it off and feed it to the pigs. He said, that began to look good to this hungry kid. Okay, that's how bad it got. And again, everyone in the audience said, good, he's getting what he deserves. That's what would happen if even if it was my son. And Jesus goes on and he says, and the son began to think about it. And he begins to think about home. And he begins to think, maybe, maybe I can go home. And, and after, even after all that I've said and done, and he said, I certainly don't deserve any good. And he starts this, this, this speech in his mind. I'll go to my dad. And I'll say, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, but would you hire me? I mean, at least your servants have food. You know, I got nothing. He's saying, maybe Dad will be good enough to me uh, to, to give me some food. And again, Jesus, who's making this whole story up in order to make a very emotional point uh, that no one would have agreed to if he had started with the point, says this. The kid begins to go back home. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with. And if Jesus had turned to his audience right there and said, fill in the blank, they would have all said anger. The father was filled with anger. He was filled with disgust, filled with, you know, like, what are you doing back here? I mean, that's how they would have, that's how they would have answered it. Because both sides, how dare the son treat the father this way? First of all, to do what he did, and now to come back and to ask him for something after the father had already given him, you know, his inheritance that he was going to get ahead of time. Um, and so the, the father sees the son and who's, you know, done what this son's done to his father. So the only emotion both sides in that audience felt was anger. But you already put it on the screen for you there. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, compassion for him. And notice he ran to his son. I, you know, in my picture, I'd say, I'm going to wait till he gets up here. <laughs> you know, he runs to his son uh, and, he, and he throws his arms around him. And now everybody listening to this story, and maybe some of you here and some of you watching are just a little bit confused because typically when Jesus told a story, usually someone in the story represented God and someone represented the listener. And the listener was encouraged, find yourself in the story and, you know, and, and learn the lesson there. And up until this point, they got that the father represented God because the kid was about to get what, what he deserved. And that's what God does. That's what the Pharisees taught. That's what the sinners believed is God's going to give you exactly what you deserve. And, and, and so, so they got this, and, but they already got in the story that the father was God. And so they did this. And suddenly this father, who, who both sides knew represented God in this parable, throws his arms around this kid that's got to be smelly by this time. That probably doesn't look the same. You know, hard life plays on your physical looks. And uh, I mean, uh, throws his arms around him. I mean, this kid who had done everything he possibly could to publicly humiliate his father. And the father runs to him and puts his arms around him. And everybody in the audience has got to be confused. Wait a minute. That's God, and that's not how I thought God operated, if that father's God. And so the son starts the speech, and he's rehearsed all the way home, and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father doesn't argue with that. You know why? Because it's true. It's the truth. All right? He was no longer worthy to be called his son. But the father said to his servants, and I love this first word, he said, quick, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And like I said, I think the word that impacts me most is that word quick, because what I think that, that we ought to do is to see how this is going to go first. Let's see if the kid's really going to stay home. 
before we throw him a party. Let's see if he's really sorry. Let's make sure he's not just hungry, wants a good meal, and then he's going to take off and embarrass his father again. Let's give him some time. Let's see if he's really repentant, if he really means it. Or maybe this is just kind of, you know, a jailhouse confession. But the father goes on and he says, bring the fattened calf, the one that they would, you know, feed and bulk up for big events and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. Okay? Now, if you grew up in Sunday school, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you did, but if you grew up in Sunday school, this is where the story always ended, wasn't it? I mean, what a great story, you know? And, and, and I mean, it was an amazing thing. And if you've been to church, you, you've heard this story somewhere. And, and what I just told you was the part that you've probably heard. And if you were taught to look into a story that Jesus told and find yourself, you would say, oh, I'm the prodigal. You know, I've done these things in my life, and I come back to God, and He just hugs me, and everything's great, and, and, and life goes back to normal. Life goes back to normal, okay? But do you remember at the beginning of the story, Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. Two sons. One is a behavior, and one is a misbehavior. One is a good guy who's doing what the firstborn son does. He's out working. He's out finishing up his day. And, and all of this is going on. And as he begins to come back to the house, Jesus says, he begins to hear noise. And it sounds like a party. I mean, there's people laughing. And there's, there's music. And, and there's all this, you know, celebration kind of sounds going on. And he looks and, and, and man, his neighbor, all the neighbors and people that, in town that he knows, they're all there. And, and it seems like something going on. And I'm sure as he gets close enough, he can even smell the aroma of all of the food. And, and some of them are dancing. And he asks one of his servants, he goes, what's going on? What's going on? I didn't know about this. And the servant smiles and says, your brother's back. Your brother's back, the misbehavior, the one who publicly embarrassed and humiliated your dad. Your brother's back, and your dad's throwing a party, and those two things don't fit for this older brother. Anyway, and he's invited everyone, and dad said for you to get cleaned up and join the celebration, at which point everyone in the audience in front of Jesus there identified with the older brother, and they thought, what? What? That, that's, that's so unfair. I mean, I know how I would feel. And, and Jesus said the older brother became angry. Remember, that was the emotion that we thought the father should rightfully have. But the older brother became angry. And I love this picture in your mind. He refused to go in. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to stand out here and smell the food and listen to him having a good time. And I am not going, you know, so we, we all get that one. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever met an angry Christian? You ever met an angry Christian? Uh, you ever seen an angry pastor? You know, I, co I told you a couple weeks ago, and a lot of people commented on it later, that that impacted more than anything else I said. I said, Jesus smiled more than we do. I think Jesus smiled more than we do. H have you ever watched some television preachers and thought, what's he mad about? You know, what's he mad about? Have you ever left a church because you were tired of being around angry Christians? Have you ever watched... Okay, don't go there, Jerry. Here goes. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever watched on TV as people who represent themselves as, represent themselves as Christians picket and boycott and scream at other people? And, and you watch that? And, and I have to ask, why does it seem like some Christians are so angry? Why does it seem like they're so against everything, you know? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But has anyone told the Christians about that? So now you have a dad who's throwing a party, and he's invited the community, and there's excellent food, and there's a celebration, and on one side of the house is a son who's not sure he deserves to come back in, and on the other side of the house you have a son that agrees. He's not sure that his brother should be allowed to come back in, but neither of them are coming in the house, and dad has to go out to both of them. And here's a dad, bless his heart, he just wants to have a celebration. That's all he wants. One says, I don't deserve this, and the other says, you're right, you don't deserve it. And Jesus said the older brother, older brother became angry and refused to go in, so the father went out. Remember he went out to the young son, the prodigal son? He also goes out to the older brother. I mean, again, this was not done at that time. 
He's going, Jesus is teaching about God going to an extreme to, to, because of, of, of how much he values being with us. And, and the father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, <laughs> I just think back to my dad. If I'd ever said, dad, look, uh, it would not have been well. Uh, the story would not have ended well for me. That just didn't work. But look, all of these years I've been slaving for you. I've been the behavior. I've never disobeyed your orders. And, 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 and let me just mess with some of you for a little bit. Okay, you that are here and you that are watching. Do you know why as a Christian you're so angry? And this is going to be hard to hear, so just kind of hang on. Let me tell you why you get angry as a Christian. It's because you think you deserve something from God that someone else might get. You think God deserves to give you something, but you wait a minute, he's giving it to somebody else. You think, I've been so faithful, God. Can, can you see us standing before God and say, hey, I've been faithful to you. I've been so obedient. I stayed in that marriage. I took care of my kids. I tithed. I did so many good things. And it seems like the holier we get, the angrier we get. And every time we hear about bad people and good things happening to them, we just kind of sit back and say, well, it's a good thing there's a hell. Because that's where they're going one day. Let them enjoy it now, you, you know. But we find ourselves secretly rejoicing in what goes around comes around. And we wish the parable ended up with this guy feeding pigs. Because that's what he deserves. Okay? And if that's the way you feel, Christian here and Christian out there, then you're angry. And you're self-righteous. And you're not following Jesus. But don't worry. Because you can be angry and still be a good Christian. But we're not going to settle for Christian, all right? You can start a movement around that kind of Christianity. And you can get a group of people to march with you and to wave signs and to, to, to wave their flags and all this. And you can boycott and you can scream about that kind of Christianity. You can do that, but you won't be following Jesus. You won't be following Jesus. And the son went on and he said, you never even gave me a, remember the brother gets the fattened calf and said, you never even gave me a young goat so I can celebrate my friend, with my friends. And I love this part. But when this son of yours, he doesn't say my brother. He says, when this son of yours, mom and dad in here, you ever do that? You know, the dad comes home and the mom says, your kids. <laughs> Not my kids when they act like that. Your kids. When this son of yours who has squandered, there's the word, your property with prostitutes. Now, he doesn't know that. Squandered your property with prostitutes. You kill the fattened calf for him. I am mad. This bothers me. It's so unfair. And listen to the father. My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. I haven't forgotten you. I haven't forgotten you. You're always with me. And I love this, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now is alive. He was lost and now he's found. And can I say, your brother was not with us and now he's with us, with us, okay? So son, I need you to come to the celebration, not because he's getting what we deserve, but because life's, the Christian life is, or following me is not about performance. It's not about sowing and reaping. It's about proximity. He's back. You never left. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. You know, what are you so mad about? You know, and when you pull back all of the, the layers, you know what the root of it is when it comes to following Jesus? And, and like I said, this is going to be a little uncomfortable, but I think it'll change you and it'll change me and us. And, and I think it's what God intends to change the world is that God could not love you any more than he does right now. You know, and, and some of you, you go, well, that's because I'm pretty good. And some of you say, I can't believe that. I guess it's one of the things I've taught over the years that people have come up to me after and said, really? Do you know what I've done? I said, no, but God does. And <laughs> he can't love you anymore. He does, it doesn't affect how he loves. It's not about performance. It's not about sowing and reaping. Let me, let me put it this way, okay? Every person that you ever come across, 
Put it this way. God never gets mad at lost things ever. God never gets mad at lost things ever. So where does our, where does our anger come from? I know where it comes from. It comes from self-righteousness. It comes from, I have been faithful. I am in, I've been in church. I have served. I, 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 I. And God says, well, that's all pretty good, but that's not the issue. The issue is proximity. It's always proximity. And listen, when we get this church, this grace and truth, when this sinks in, when it saturates our thinking, when it works its way into who we are as a church and who you are as a follower of Jesus, and I know that there's tension there, and and we've talked about that tension, and you may have a whole bunch of questions, and just let me tell you before you ask, I don't have a whole bunch of answers, okay? But I'm going by what Jesus said. When we begin to extend grace and truth to people, Sin should always break our heart, and repentance should always stir our heart. When we see sin, instead of getting angry, it should make us sad. It should break our heart. And when someone takes the first step back, we ought to be like that father that says, I'm going to go to him with compassion. I'm going to go to him with compassion. And when you and I see someone in sin, and when we see a segment of our society and our culture moving in the direction of sin, you know, and we want to be angry and carry our signs and wave our flags and, and, you know, scream out, it should not make us angry anymore. It should break our hearts. It should make us sad. And if it doesn't break your heart, you've got some work to do. But you don't have to sit around and tell me how bad bad is all the time. And you don't have to tell me how sinful sin is. I'm living in this world. I know that. And Jesus knew that. But Jesus knew that when this son returned, the father's heart was not filled with anger towards him. It was filled with compassion because compassion never went away. Compassion never went. He never stopped loving the son who walked away. Never stopped loving the son. And and, and you know what? As a church, what, what ought to just... Make us bust out around. I mean, there's a lot. As I meet with pastors in town and we, you know, share our stories and, and you know, I kind of commiserate. With, but you know what ought to make us at Atlantic Coast just bust out around here? The, the, the biggest thing, it ought to be whenever someone comes or returns to the Father. Okay? When, when someone comes into church and we kind of go, what are they doing here? That ought to make us happy when that happens. We ought to get excited when someone even begins to take a step towards home. Because in the story Jesus told, when he started towards home, the father got up and ran to him. And we got to make up our mind. Are we going to be like the father who gets up and runs? Or are we going to be like the older brother who says, well, let's see how it goes. I'm serious. This kills a lot of churches. You know? It, I, mean, I mean, it just does. That, that, that'll make us bust out around here. And like I said, if it, if it bothers you that I'm saying these things, I'm glad. Work on it. Work on it. I, I want you to think about it. I want you to go home and wrestle with this but because I want me and I want you and I want us to learn how to become more and more comfortable with carrying this tension between the truth of God and the grace of God. And I want me and I want you and I want us to refuse to let go of either. Because if we do, we lose something. And in closing, I want to talk to the other one in this parable, the, the, the prodigal. Because maybe some of you in here today or some of you watching now are prodigals. You've turned your back on God. And you know it. And, and some of you use an old-fashioned term. You'd say, I'm living in sin. And you know it. And there's a tension in your life. And you know things are not right with you and God. I want to say to you today, come back home to the Father. Just come back home. Just take that first step. And you need to know that not because someone's mad at you, but because if you continue in sin, sin will get you. It has consequences. And you will have scars and regrets and sorrows and pain and hurt and consequences from which you may never fully recover. And I know that because I've been you. All right? i found that it's better to be with God than apart from God. It's better to be with a group of imperfect people who are trying to get it right than to be apart from them. It's always better to be with than apart. So I invite you to come back, to come back, to come home. 
because there's tension in your life and you're tired of, of having to drink it away or medicate it away or ignore it away. But Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. And to the degree that we as a church are about seeking and sa- helping people come back to the Father, that's the degree to which we are truly disciples of Christ. God always desires relationship, and he'll go to all extremes. He went to the extreme of sending his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for our time together this morning. I'm thankful for a powerful story that Jesus told and uh, how both sides were impacted by that. And God, I pray today for everyone who's listening, not just the people that are here, but those that are listening, that they'll take this to heart and, and, and not, you know, that they'll say the most important thing is that the Father wants me to be with him and he'll go to any extreme. He'll forgive my sin. He sent his son to die on the cross and forgive me. He wants me to come back home. And God, Father, for those of us who, who say, well, we're already back home and, and we deserve it and those people don't, God, soften our hearts. Help us to drop the anger and help our hearts to be filled with compassion so we can truly be followers of Jesus. We're thankful for Jesus today. And we pray this in his name. And everyone said, amen. Amen.
bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god's soul